Uh, tonight, let's uh, continue with, uh, with our uh, study on uh, Peter. Let's go to uh, First Peter chapter 4. By the way, keep, keep in prayer the, uh, the forthcoming uh, election. The midterm is going to be critical. There was enough time after all the fiasco. There was enough time for the... Uh, progressives to come up with a counter. So I think right now the polls are, are evening out. And so there's a big possibility that whatever gains the conservatives are thinking of having may not happen. And the country has uh, continued to uh, uh, plunge into this uh, moral abyss. And so these are, these are signs of the last days though. So I, I think if there is a book in the Bible that uh, we should really be reading, it will be the writings of Peter, Jude, and Revelation. You will notice that these three books addresses a lot of the things that we are going through today. And uh, the Bible calls for times of rejoicing, but with certain uh, price, okay? Well, the last two Fridays we've been talking about sufferings. Now, although we're talking about sufferings, understand the main theme is growing in our salvation. Now, there is such a thing as uh, growing pains. And whenever a person goes into growth, there are always things that gives pain. Suffering is one of those among the Christians. Now, with everything that is going on around us, we will begin to realize that actually control is an illusion. The other day, there's this, I, I don't know exactly what day was that, big, uh, was it hurricane or storm in? Florida. Hurricane? Florida. Florida. Some sections, what, what's this, 18 feet of water? I mean, I, I thought I was just misreading it. I thought it's inches, you know. But you know how, how, how tall 18 feet is? That's, that's tall, you know. So that's more than three times of my, that's more than three times of, of uh, my height. And that's uh, one of the deepest that, that they have uh, run. And then, of course, in, in Europe, you have this uh, Putin guy making now official threat on using his nuclear arsenal. And with the, uh, with the last days that we are in, you know that that's pretty much in play. Uh, but not until Jesus returns because the Bible says that this present world will be melted uh, by fire. Now, some uh, apocalysts, uh, they they say that it's going to be because of uh, meteors. And in the 80s, when I was studying all of this, the fear was interplanetary alignment. That the moment there is interplanetary alignment, I don't know what that exactly means. It will cause some radiation, all of those things. It, it never happened, you know. And now there's this uh, blood moon and then all of these things that are taking place. But the Bible is very clear. The, the present world that we are in right now, everything will be melted by the heat of fire. And so that, that gives us perspective on how we should be looking at the value of what we call as wealth. Um, wealth is also becomes uh, illusion in that sense because, look, everything that we are working for so hard right now they're going to melt, and eventually, of course, if you die, you're not going to be able to bring them in heaven. And so the question now is, what is the proper value of those wealth then? Well, we have learned so far that's actually for the kingdom of God. Now, if, when, when I say that with everything that is going on, everything is uh, controlled, it's actually an illusion, uh, there are things that are, that, that are going on there around us that if you don't put your faith, if you don't know how to cast your faith on God, you can be so discouraged and uh, let go of your faith, especially in times of uh, great sufferings. 
I think silently they are intense, intensifying persecution, in fact, in, 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 uh, in Egypt. Uh, in China, we know, by the way, officially now, officially, the parliament, or however you call it in, in Hong Kong, is officially all CCP. They have, they have uh, successfully taken out all the pro-democracy groups. I wouldn't say conservative, but all the pro-democracy, they took them out. And Carrie Lam has been replaced by another person that is a 100% a, a CCP. And so now our, our friends in Hong Kong, our brothers there, are in big trouble because the, the single enemy that the communism believe it has is actually Christianity. Let me remind you that uh, in the 80s especially, there was a death threat uh, when he was still alive on, on Dr. Uh, Paul Yong Cho because he built that uh, prayer mountain. The prayer mountain is actually in the border of the 38th parallel. And from, the, from what I heard and from what I read, when that prayer mountain was built, Koreans were going there to pray because of the war going on against North Korea. And while they are praying, they'll be hearing gunshots firing. They'll be hearing grenades blasting. They'll, be, they'll even be hearing mines exploding because of the million mines in the, in the, the DMZ. And so it, uh, it was egging the Christians to pray even more. And according to the first generation of Christians who went to the prayer mountain during that period of time, they were seeing demonic manifestations. And faith prevailed. And so North Korea, not, not Kim Jong-un, his father, uh, I forgot the name of his dad, believed that the number one reason why the North was not able to overtake the South was because of Dr. Paul Yong Chao. And so they put a hit on him. Yeah. They put a hit on him. In fact, when he was in the Philippines, when we were hosting him, there was a very real threat that uh, the national security in the Philippines, we were, we were informed. And we hired the uh, Korean CIA, uh, had their men all over. Doc you cannot approach Dr. Cho, I remember picking him up from the airport and suddenly we were stopped by these Koreans. They're the Korean CIA. It's a national treasure that we cannot just approach. We have to be recognized for him to be able to approach us. And then when we were sending him to the airport to go back to Korea, there was this guy that was just closing in on Yong Cho and, and there's this Secret Service person just, I thought he was going to break his arm. The wife was crying. Oh, please don't do it. And just right in front of us. And young Gichu just turned around. And, and then later on, we were he was used to that. Because the death threat was very real on him because of the prayers of the saints. So that is, that is the kind of thing. And then, of course, after that, because of the height of that persecution. Now, uh, this is the, the timeline they came up with this teaching that Jesus was coming on September of 1985. Because of all of these things that are going on, they thought Jesus is going to return in 1985. Of course, that was wrong. Because uh, if somebody tells you that they know when Jesus will be coming back, then he's a liar and he doesn't have the Spirit of God. But the same thing is, is going on right now. As the last days end, because it's been the last days, as the last days end, uh, more and more of what we may call as a last ditch effort from the enemy will come into play. Because the Bible says the devil know his time is short. Therefore, it is important that we know how to entrust ourselves in God. You know, that's the title of our teaching tonight, entrusting yourself in God. Who are you uh, entrusting yourself to? That is a big question. 
Some, some entrust, uh, put their trust in the strength of arm. There's a, there's a psalm that says, do not put your trust in princes. You put your trust in God. Because all, all the promises that man makes fails. Why? Because of the human limitation. You know, a, a new couple uh, getting married, the man will say, I'll take care of you for the rest of, of, uh, of uh, my life. And then suddenly he died. Oh, who's this? Is this Eliza? Eliza? It's her friend. Her friend's, what, girlfriend, was just visiting her. And he was about, I was told he was about to propose in one month marriage. So she was about, she's just close by uh, region. So she was going to visit him. Uh, I think a couple of hours drive, and three hours drive. About to visit her. Uh, and on the road, she hit a semi dead she was supposed he was supposed to propose marriage to her in one month and then you see these are things that that are not and these are supposedly christians these are things that are not within human control and so you will find that a lot of things are really not within your control i mean i mean how, how many times do you say i'm, I'm gonna do this you don't even have control of yourself you cannot even discipline yourself to really do that at a certain time. You know, I'm going to wake up at uh, 6 a.m. Well, the 6 a.m. Uh, alarm rang, and then you, you turn it off, and you even curse the phone. Shut up, you know. Um, and, and the fact is you put on three different alarms, meaning you will not obey the first one. We are preparing to, to disregard. How many of you do your alarm like that? You have three alarms. Every 15 minutes, you see? Because you know, <laughs> you know that the first alarm you will, you will disregard. So why wake yourself up? You have to put the alarm on the time that you will, that you will really wake up. You know? I have three different alarms. It's not because of that. It's because when I'm deep sleeping, I will not be able to hear it. You know, so... So I put three different alarms, but uh, normally, 99.9% .9 of the time, when the first alarm, I wake up, and that's it. But there's a lot of things, really, that are not within our control. But one thing we can control is if we can, if we can learn, if we can just learn to say, I'm putting my faith in God. I am entrusting myself to Him. Now, you can choose to entrust yourself on other people that will fail. You can even choose to entrust yourself to yourself. That will dismally fail also. Because you know how much we fail ourselves. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Above all, maintain constant love for one another. That's, that's hard. Since love, this is not the context, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining, just as each one has received a gift. Use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If I ask this question, are you gifted? A normal answer would be, yes, I am. The next question is, why are you gifted? Peter says, the purpose of your gifts is to serve others. Now, in the context of uh, Petrine writings, serving others means serving one another or serving the body of Christ. So whatever gifts we have, if it's not being used to serve the body, it's a misuse. Because here, here, that's what the purpose is. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides. So that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Look at the last two. If anybody can teach, let him, let him just concentrate 
or can speak, that, can, that means can teach. Let him concentrate on speaking the words of God. That is our mandate. Anybody with the gift of speaking should use it to teach the word of the Lord. Now, the other thing is, if anyone serves, oh, it's not going to be from your own strength. Let it be coming from the strength of God. Because, you know, the nature of whatever we do is service. Whether you are an employee or an employer, you still serve. But now we are told, when you are serving the Lord, don't, don't use it, don't do it, just using your own strength. Because, again, if we depend on our own strength, we'll run out. You should use it using the strength of God. These are access points that we need to learn, okay? So, let's talk about last day's faith behavior, okay? Number one, believe that the end of all things is near, considering around 2,000 years ago when this was written. Around 2,000 years ago, it says, believe that in the end all things are, is near. The important word on this statement is the word believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Same word. We have to believe that really the end is near. Now, of course, the time of God is different from our times. This was 2,000 years ago. But this was their behavior. They were always believing and they're always waiting that it's any time now. We lost that. Okay? Christianity has lost that sense. And amazingly, throughout history, that sense that it, this could be the end of, 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 of days, this could come back, is whenever there is a major event going on, like war. I mean, the First World War, they really thought Jesus was coming back again. It didn't happen. People relaxed. The Second World War, they say for sure it didn't happen. And then the Korean War broke out, and then the Vietnam War broke out. And then, of course, look at this. The Iraqi War. Or especially the Iraqi War. Remember when, when Saddam Hussein was toppled? They were showing pictures of Saddam Hussein because he made a portrait of him in the public square wherein he was dressed in the garbs of Nebuchadnezzar. Because, because Saddam Hussein really has this hope that he will be able to destroy Israel and he will restore the kingdom of, of, uh, what's, what's, uh, Bab of Babylon. Uh, Iran is uh, Persia. So Iraq is Babylon. So he was hoping to restore the kingdom of Babylon. That was Saddam Hussein. And so the Christian charter, few books were written that there is a possibility that Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist. In fact, when they, were, when they were looking at that, they said, let's see what happened because he was cornered, right? What if he survived this, they said. What if he survived this? Then he will come out stronger because he's a dictator. Well, he didn't survive. He was, he was hanged, you know, and uh, his regime was, was toppled. But whenever something like that happened, then Christians, for a brief moment, are saying, is Jesus coming back? The latest that is going on was actually the blood moon. Because the uh, sun will turn into blood and, and the moon, of course. And uh, the blood moon just took place. Uh, who's this? John Hagee wrote a book on the blood moon. He was sued for that. Because it turned out he just copied the book, you know, and, and published it. A lot of those things going on, actually. But uh, the blood moon became a big event. And so they thought that Jesus is coming back again. Well, he did, not, he did not return. But these are, these are uh, periods in human history wherein temporarily or momentarily we are made aware Jesus can come back at any time. But, uh, Paul, but Peter is saying, hey, what you have to do is to believe. Believe actually that the end is there. Not only do we believe in Jesus, we should believe that these things are ending. Second, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Okay, now, <clears throat> interesting, alert and sober-minded. If you are drunk, you will not be alert, okay? If you are drunk, you will not be sober-minded. So the opposite here is drunkenness. When you are drunk, you don't, you don't uh, behave in control, okay? What happens is, when we are told to be alert and sober-minded for prayer, 
when we are praying because for prayer, for the purpose of prayer, we are not supposed to be in panic or in terror. Okay? When we are reacting and then we don't figure out what to pray for, even our prayers are in panic. Um, there is a uh, debt collector who came to your house. You panicked. The, the guy says, I'm going to repossess this, I'm going to repossess that. So you panic. You owe uh, the creditor $20,000. So you panic, you thought you're going to die. You know? And to, so you called your friends. I, I'm, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to go crazy. I'm, that's panic. That's panic. Okay? Then you don't know how to pray. I was reading the book of uh, Pat Robertson on Shout It from the Housetops. I have a classmate at Regent who was going to be kicked out. The admissions office called him in and says, you can't pay your tuition. We're going to kick you out. I think he owes, he owes the uh, school something like $5,000, $5, or $10,000. It was a big amount of money during that time. And so he came to me because her friends. He said, Jose, keep me in prayer. I said, why? What happened? He said, I'm, I'm going to lose my, my, uh, my status at Regent. My work is not enough. He was working in the bookstore. He said, I'm going to be kicked out. I said, I said, wait a minute. He said, what do you want to pray for? Well, because I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, well, what are we going to pray for? If I, we're going to pray, what are we going to pray for? He said, I really don't know. So he's asking for prayer. He doesn't know. I said, well, how much do you need? He said, I, I forgot, five or $10,000. Pray that, that I'll be given scholarship. I said, why? I said, why don't we calculate? He said, let's follow the book of Pat Robertson. I said, uh, no, no, uh, Robert Schiller. I said, what if somebody give you $5,000, I said, then you're going to have, uh, you're going to have uh, instant relief. What if somebody, five people give you $1,000 each? I said, you're right. What I said if 10 people give you 500, well, I, I, what? and then I, 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 keep, I keep graduating until I say, what if so many people give you $50? I said, you have a lot of friends here at, at, at Regent. And I said, I'll tell you what, I said, uh, I can give you $50. So I wrote him a check right there. I said, $50. I said, find other partners in the school, your friends, who can give you $50. Because he was panicking. You know, at the end of the day, and all things are said and done, he was not kicked out. He kept his job. He was given allowance. He did not come up with the money. But Regent did not kick him out. He graduated, actually, from the school. But can you imagine that kind of prayer, panic? A lot of people, when they are in crisis, they, uh, they pray in panic mode. Okay. The most critical thing when you're in crisis is do, do not think crisis. Crisis mentality will get you in trouble. You will not be able to think straight. So here, considering all things are near, hey, be sober-minded. You know, yeah, Jesus is coming back again. But don't be like those Koreans in 1980s. They sold their properties, went to the mountains, and wait for the second coming of the Lord. They forgot the other scriptures. That's why Christianity began to have a bad reputation in Korea. That right now, although they have the highest rate of percentage of Christians in the world, as, a, as far, far as a country is concerned, their Christianity has gone down because of the discreditation, and that was not proper way of thinking. Our mood or our behavior should also not be erratic. When you say sober-minded, we cannot... We cannot just jump into a situation without assessing the situation. David said, every day I present my prayers to you, O Lord. The Hebrew for that is, I put in order the prayers. He has a list, you know. For example, this, this, this coming Friday, we have a uh, prayer night. Well, you can tell what we pray for. But actually, I, I, I go through that in my mind, and I look at the news, current events, what could be the possible things to pray for. We learned that from Billy Graham. Billy Graham said, I, I read the newspaper to look for prayer items. He said, pa, uh, Billy Graham says, that's where I get my prayer requests from, from the newspaper. He said, I read this, and so I pray about this. But we need to be able to to uh, not be in a panic mode. Otherwise, our prayers will not be orderly. You know? That's why I, I, I told you, when, when you go to church, I've been saying this for years, come early so that you can unclutter your soul. You can sit down. I mean, 
you may even fall asleep, you know. I, I think it will be a blessing if you come here, say, say, for example, 15, 20, 30 minutes earlier and fall asleep. So during the service, you don't sleep, you know. But the thing, thing about that could be a blessing. And another thing is you can actually unclutter your soul and begin to think through uh, preparing your spirit to receive from the Lord and then what will be your uh, prayer request. By the way, when, when somebody is teaching like me like this, it is a source of prayer request for you guys, personal prayers, what you should be praying for. But you can only do that if you are sober-minded and you're always alert. Next, maintain constant love for one another. That's the third behavior. Now, <clears throat> this has to be maintained and not waver from it like a drunk person from the previous verse, be sober-minded. Therefore, love here has some logical uh, side. You, you don't say, well, I don't like how you look right now. I don't love you anymore. You look older now. You look fatter now or you look thinner now. I don't love you anymore. That is not being sober-minded. When I'm counseling couples, for example, that are uh, having difficulty in their relationship, say they want to divorce or something like that, one of the things I go through is actually 1 Corinthians 13 without discussing it. You know, I will ask the wife or the husband, when it's dinner time, do you still offer each other a meal? Oh, pastor, I'm even worried because he did not come to eat. Uh, it's already 10 p.m. Well, you're still thinking of something beneficial for your spouse. That is being kind. Love is kind. That means you still love the person. But you see, we equate love with emotion. And so a lot of people actually, like, like these two youngsters that, uh, who divorced, they came to me for prayer. They are, they are determined they're divorced. But they are looking at each other, they are giggling, and, and the guy looks at the girl and says, you know, no matter what, even if you divorce me, I will still love you forever. And I was looking, and then the girl said, you know that I still love you. And then they are divorcing. You see, they are thinking about feelings, they are not sober-minded. A lot of times when we say we love somebody or we don't love somebody, it's being spoken without being sober-minded. Because there is a sense of logic here. You don't waver like a drunk person when you say, I love somebody, I love this person. This has the tone of persistency. In other words, persistent love in spite of. I think a clear illustration of this will be from parents that uh, children can be rebellious or disobedient, but their love persists. You know, kids will suffer if they do wrong, but, but the persistent love that parents have. Why? This is what we were discussing last time. Love covers a multitude of sin. Uh, this, was, this was taken from Proverbs 10, 12. Let me read to Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred steers up conflicts. But love covers all offenses. You see, people misunderstood this word, love covers the multitudes of sin, as, as if it's saying it condones sin. Well, look at Proverbs 10, 12. It's the opposite. Hatred steers up conflicts. This is what hatred does. There is no problem. You create a problem. That's hatred, you know. For example, among married couples, you've got to be wary and careful and sensitive to what comes out of, of your lips. For example, uh, you, you tell your wife, hey, hey, listen, I like your dress. If only, if only you will lose 10 pounds, that will really fit perfect. So I just said, you have a nice dress. If you lose 10 pounds, that will look better. And then the wife pick it up and say, why, you're calling me fat? You don't like me anymore? What happened there? The wife steers up trouble. You see? And I've noticed that. You know? In fact, between me and my wife, it's the same. Sometimes I'll be the one telling my wife, hey, listen, why, why are you looking for trouble? And sometimes my wife will tell me, ah, hindi na kita Because you, you end up, that's actually coming from the spirit of hatred. Hatred is tears of trouble. Tears of trouble means there is no trouble. 
You stir it up. It's not stirred. <laughs> there could be a problem, but there is no trouble. But hatred generates trouble. That's why some people are very creative in coming up with trouble, with hostility. You really invent things to make people angry. Like, for example, a boyfriend and girlfriend in the Philippines. I don't know here exactly. But a guy or a, or the guy or a, the girl wants to break up. They create trouble. I mean, they come up with, you know, I, I can't live with this. We have been together for, for one year and you're like that. I can't live. Well, you have been tolerating that for the longest time. And then suddenly, you're creating trouble. You know that. You are creating trouble. You see? And so, hatred does that. But love covers the most Jews of sin. And I explained that last week partially. You don't shame people that you love. Now, they can shame themselves. But you don't shame them. And really, when a person is doing wrong, automatically, one of the byproducts of that is, they, is that they will shame themselves. So for example, you, you, sleep, you sleep around, and so you get pregnant, or you made somebody pregnant. What, what, I remember confronting one pastor, I said, because the, the members came to me and said, you know, the pastor's daughter is, uh, is pregnant. So I went to the pastor in private, I said, hey, pa pastor, you know, uh, People notice that uh, your daughter got married, but she's barely married, and now the tummy is showing, uh, showing up. And I said, uh, people will be talking. I said, I jam, I'm just forewarning you. Well, the guy got upset. But you see, nobody is still some trouble then. Well, she made some mistakes. She sinned, and her tummy... I mean, if somebody's tongue is growing up, what are you going to do? Are you going to ignore it? You know? I, unless, of course, it's a guy, you can ignore it. <laughs> but if it's a girl, uh, you, you say, hey, you're, you're, are you sick? Your tummy is big. Oh, I'm pregnant. Oh, you just got married last week. How, how many? Now, nobody's stirring up trouble there. You brought it upon yourself. You know, so, some people just just uh, invite trouble to themselves. But if you're operating in love, like I, I talked to this pastor and I said, hey, hey, listen, you better be prepared for this. I said, I know it's not your fault, it's your daughter, but, but people are, are asking questions. You have to uh, be ready to answer that. In fact, I offered help. Of course, it was rejected. But love covers the multitude of sin. The opposite of that is gossip. Gossip is still up trouble because gossip by its very nature is looking for trouble. You know, there was a lady here before she was, she was complaining about uh, another member of the church. Both of them left already. So I said, sister, you know, I cannot, I cannot answer for that. I said, so. I said, why, why don't we talk? Oh, well, I'm scared, Pastor. Sir. Well, I'll be the one, I'll, I'll be in between, I said. So let's settle this, your sisters. So let's uh, fix this. So they, they sat in my office, and the guy is there, uh, you know, with their husbands. And I said, hey, listen, sister. Uh, this sister here came to me and is very offended because, because of, what you, of, of what you said. And she told me this. And the other party said, oh, you said that? Look at her. And she said, in front of me, I didn't say that. You know, when she said that, I knew that she got scared. This is what I said. Oh, I'm very sorry. I said, maybe I heard it from the birds. Yeah. I was very upset. I said, maybe I heard it from the birds. And so I look at those two couple and I said, I'm dismissing this meeting. I'm very sorry for wasting your time. But I heard it from the birds. And, and, and the lady backed off because she knew. She put me on the spot and I said, oh, I, I, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but what I mean is, I said, no, no, forget it. I said, I heard it from the birds. I said, let's just drop it. And I repeated, I don't know why, I just like the phrase. I heard it from the birds, you know. <laughs> I like that phrase. Well, because I don't like any more trouble to be steered. But the trouble, and nevertheless, the, the two of them 
uh, fought and uh, both left the church. Yeah. Because really, when, when hatred is in play, they're da- you don't need to have a reason. You will create conflicts. Some uh, witnesses here and some of the left and said, I report them to the Department of Children, Welfare, something like that. I did not report, but the, the couple just created trouble. And the amazing thing about that is some actually in the church believe him. Yeah. But the trouble is just 100% fabricated. Because I did not report. But that is what hatred does. You know when somebody already hates you. When, when they are coming up with uh, conflicts. You know that somebody loves you if uh, they are not trying to shame you. Okay? Now, you can, you, nobody can stop you from shaming yourself. I mean, you can shame yourself all you want. But the person who loves you will do their best to cover the multitude of sin. And I told you it means you don't shame the person. You don't steer conflict. Do not be a source of gossip that can lead to more trouble. Instead, let the stirring up of conflicts end in you. Okay? Let it end in you. Fourth, be hospitable to one another without complaining. Now, I believe here that the context, again, is still Christian suffering, which we'll go to in the next passage. It is during these times that, you know, when somebody is suffering, say they are being persecuted, they're going to go to jail, they lose their house, that's the context of the New Testament, or their relatives die, that is the context of this hospitality. It is during these times that we need to be a brother or a sister to those who are being pressured. You know, you know I, I, I like it, for example, in, in, in America. For example, right now, there is a hurricane in Florida. And so a lot of fundraising are going on, operations, blessing. We're going to send money to operations, blessing. Uh, it's just smart and purse. And I always use these two agencies whenever we help. Uh, I always use uh, Operations Blessing or, uh, or Samaritan Purse because I trust the founder of those two organizations. But what, what I like is actually the way Americans come together in times of crisis like this. But have you noticed lately it becomes too partisan? that one party will be rejoicing that the other party. Remember when Mitt Romney was running for president and there was a hurricane? I think it was New Jersey. So Obama has to go there because he's president and try to bring comfort to the people of New Jersey. And Mitt Romney says, well, because of this event, I will suspend, I will not campaign during this period until Obama can campaign. Because the Republicans were, were egging Mitt Romney. Now, this is time. Go on the attack, okay? Because he will be in New Jersey. He will not be able to campaign. And Mitt Romney says, no. I actually like what, what he said. He said, he said, he said, he said no, it's not, it's not fair. It's not right. He said, there is tragedy in New Jersey. And so I'm going to let him do his job as a president. And after he's done there and resume campaigning, then I will go back to the campaign trail. They saw it as a sign of weakness by some Republicans on the part of Romney, especially Doug Christie. He really thought it was a sign of weakness. But I thought it was very gentlemanly of, uh, of uh, Romney. But of course, his being a gentleman was not repaid by, by political hostility. You know? That was, that was a, a miscalculation on his part. But this is the idea of hospitality. Somebody is suffering, somebody is being persecuted, somebody is in trouble, Hey, be an open door. This hospitality here doesn't translate welcome them in their house, unless they lost their house. But, but this means do not add trouble to this person. You know, the person is already in trouble. Do not add trouble to this person. You need to learn how to be hospitable, especially in times of pressure. And this is the context, again, use your gifts to serve others. You are gifted then use that properly for service. 
Can you imagine if all Christians will, will shift gear and say, I will make use of my gifts to make sure that the other members of the body of Christ is served. Then we'll have a very healthy community. This, is, this hospitality carries the idea of not just saying, how are you doing? But this carries the idea of doing it with considerable effort. Okay, with considerable effort. I mean, you're, you're walking extra mile, you go out of your way to be hospitable as you use your gifts to serve others. Why are you gifted? Your gifting is for the purpose of service. So no matter how gifted a person is, if that gift is not being used in the kingdom of God, it's a wasted gift. Those who speak, speak God's word, not man's word, okay? Those who serve, the Greek word here for serve is the word for deacon. You serve with the strength that he provides. It's for the glory of God. Okay, so now after, after discussing that, then he went back to the idea of suffering. But this time the theme is joy in suffering. Verse 12 of chapter 4. Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you and uh, among you to test you. As if something unusual were happening to you. You know, this a fiery ordeal, you know, the background of this one will be the friends of Daniel. It was a real fiery ordeal. But that's the background in the Jewish mind. <clears throat> it is to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ. So that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let the glory of God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. That's the context. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who disobey the gospel of God? When we are actually suffering because of our faith, suffering the Christian suffering and, and suffering of Christ, that is actually a form of judgment. When Christians suffer, judgment has begun in the household of God. I, rem I remember during the uh, 80s when, what's this? Uh, uh, Jimmy Swaggart fell, and then, of course, prior to that is Jim Baker. And then there's another one from Louisiana, uh, McGorman, uh, Gorman. They all fell. And so it's embarrassing. I was a young Christian. It was very embarrassing. Did you, did you guys realize after that, all kinds of politicians and world leaders came out they were discovered to be having extramarital affairs and all of those things. But judgments always begin in the house of God. Have you noticed? Look at the pattern. Uh, there were several attacks coming against the faith movement, against Copeland, against Oral Roberts, against all of these people who are teaching prosperity. What happens next after that? All of these politicians who have inside information to get, uh, in the stock market came out. The multi-million dollar deals that are very corrupt that are going on came out. Judgment always begins in the house of God. When you see a stirring taking place in the church, you know what happened? The world looks at that and says, you see, they call themselves Christians. This is what's happening. Actually, that judgment is beginning. Because after that, then what happens to the world? And so this will es escalate. And if a person, and if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? You see? So then let those who suffer according to God's will and trust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. That's where I get the title. Peter goes back to the subject of suffering. So we know that the preceding passage we studied is in the context of Christian suffering. That is what we just learned about 
loving one another, serving one another. Fiery ordeal or suffering is not unusual for the believers. Look at this. Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you. Say you are tested right now. You don't go, oh, look what's happening. He said, don't be surprised. Said, don't be surprised. You are teaching your, your child to walk. What do you expect when, the, when you're teaching your child to walk? They will fall. What else do you expect? They will cry. What else? You don't have a child yet and you're answering. Ah, you have brothers. What else? So they will fall. They will cry. What else? You need to have some first aid kits. Right? What else? What do you do with, with your house? Your, your child is beginning to walk. You, uh, how do you call that? The child proof. Right? Why? Because when they start walking and they start falling, is it unusual? That is ordinary. So, so sometimes I laugh, I'll be in a house, and then a child is trying to walk, and, and you're talking with, uh, with uh, the person, and the child fell, and there's nothing wrong, and the mom or the dad just jump out of their seat. Because sometimes I have those kind of visits in my house when my kids are learning to walk, and Joseph or John will fall, and the guests will be saying, hey, your child fall. Oh, don't, don't. Forget let, let, let him stand up. That's ordinary. Yeah. You know why God doesn't fa- panic when we suffer? That's ordinary. It's not unusual. Yeah. Because have you noticed you will be suffering? No, I'm talking about Christian suffering, not the suffering that you brought to yourself. You're being persecuted. And you cry to the Lord and he doesn't panic. You know why? Because God looks at you, oh, that's a test. It's a... Uh, You know, none of my kids use the, uh, on the door. How do they call that? The walking, the walker. Okay. Uh, I, I think, one, one, I don't know, I forgot who among my kids was very creative. What he did, you know, we'll have boxes. He started holding onto the boxes, and the boxes he started pushing. That's where he held onto. And I watched that, and I said, whoa, my, my child is very creative. None of my child use uh, a walker. Because I, thought it was, because I thought it was natural for a child to try to stand up, to crawl, you know. Now, when you see corners like this, you protect that, and you try to catch their head or parts of their body that can fall. You try to cushion it. But I never stop my kids from falling. I watch them fall. And I did not cry out and say, let's bring them to the air. No. Yes. It's usual. Remember that night in the old building? Uh, Joseph was playing and he, he put a bead in his nose. You know, kids, kids are naughty. He put a bead on, in his nose. And uh, <clears throat> I was leading the overnight prayer meeting. During those days, we pray all night and sleep all day, you know. Uh, so one of my deacons with my wife was in a panic mode. <laughs> I was very upset because I was leading the prayer. <laughs> you know, I said, oh, hold it. So I kept leading the prayer. And they were in my office. They, they, were, they want to call 911. Panic mode. Because Joseph put a bead in his nose. <laughs> so uh, after, during the break, after the prayer, I went to my office. I said, what's all the fuss? And my wife suddenly, you know, when, when we go, suddenly my wife becomes a doctor, you know. So she said, well, we need to bring her to the ER. The other deacons were saying, let's bring her to the ER. I said, why? Let, let nobody call any. Oh, pastor, we really need to call them. I said, why? What happened? I don't even know. Yet. Oh, Joseph put a bed in his nose. Now, if you are thinking a little bit, you know, you don't really need to finish first grade. You know that beads have holes. That's immediately that came to my mind. It has holes. And I was thinking, Joseph is small. The bead is too big. Obviously, it will not get into the uh, nose right away. But it can go into the nose if the bead is too small. So I asked for a sample. 
what kind of building? I said, the bit looks big. So I told Joseph, why don't you lay down? Lay down in my office. I said, don't move. So I just opened the nose. And I saw the bid, and it has the hole. You know what I did? I said, somebody give me a paper clip. So I just took it out. Yeah. I did not scream. That's not unusual. Have you heard of uh, kids crawling and they eat their own poo? <laughs> yeah. One of my classmates in engineering told me that when he was growing up, his uncle, their military family, if they see a cockroach, he will go like this. <laughs> and he said, Uncle, what happened? Oh, I ate the cockroach. Every time. Well, one day he, he saw a cockroach and the uncle was not there. So he go to the cockroach and <laughs> And then the father came, and he was munching the stuff. <laughs> and the father saw a thing, what is in your mouth? Cockroach, what? No, that's unusual, you know. <laughs> because the, the, the uncle made it appear that eating cockroach is ordinary. <laughs> you know, this is the problem with Christians. What is usual, we make it unusual. What is unusual, we make it usual. Yeah. Oh, she got pregnant without being married. Well, that's common. It's not common. That's a sin. Yeah. You mean you're, you're, you're 18 years old and you're still a virgin? And they laugh at you. No, that should be the case. Because you're not married yet. That is supposed to be ordinary. But we call it unusual. Okay, so when you're suffering, somebody is mocking you. Somebody is uh, saying you're abnormal because you're serving God. That's not unusual. You think God panics? No, it's like a baby learning. It's a test of faith. Yeah, it's a test of faith. But sometimes we overreact and we panic. We are not sober-minded. Fiery ordeal is not unusual for believers. In fact, this is... A, this is the interesting thing. It is not even supposed to surprise you. Yeah. It is, it is, you know, I, I told you that oh, my, my kids can rebel against me and they can try to backslide. You know why? That is not unusual. This, uh, this November when I go to the group and I'll be holding a, I think, six hours married couples seminar. I hope they're not listening. But if they are, what can I do, you know? <laughs> but normally, we'll talk about love and all the, uh, how do you call that? Hair-raising emotion, you know? I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the flawed families in the Bible. Yeah. I mean, the families in the Bible are all flawed. And yet, God doesn't panic about that. Why? That's not unusual for a sinner. Sinner sins. That's why the Bible says, naughtiness is in the heart of every child. Well, my, my child is naughty. That's not unusual. He's a sinner. Well, what are you surprised about? That's why God says, a rod of discipline drives it out. What is unusual is when you don't have a rod of discipline? Now, that is unusual. You call yourself a believer and you don't have a rod of discipline. That is unusual. You see, uh, I, I don't know why Tom Jones' song suddenly <laughs> came to my mind. It's not unusual. You know? But uh, maybe I'm, I'm thinking about the Prince of Bel Air. You know? But uh, I, I think when you are not sober minded, you, you don't think properly about these things. When an unbeliever persecutes you, what's the big deal? That's ordinary. The devil tries to steal, kill, and destroy you? That's, that's not a surprise. 
You know, the enemy, the enemy trying to destroy my family. That's not, that's not unusual. What is unusual if, is, is if I'm not alert. Meaning, my antenna is not up that when I begin to see things happening, I ignore it. That is unusual. Because the Bible says we are not ignorant of his schemes. When we say, when the Bible says we are not ignorant of the schemes of the enemy, that means we are knowledgeable of his schemes. Why? Because it's not unusual. He never come up with a new idea. And so when a Christian says, oh, I'm so surprised my child did this. Why are you surprised? Naughtiness is in the child, heart of every child. If we don't put out the rod of discipline, do you have a rod of discipline? No. So what is unusual about this? What is unusual is you don't have the rod of discipline. Because the naughtiness of a child is ordinary. It doesn't come as a surprise. That's why when parents say, well, my child is different, you're fooling yourself. That's unusual. Because the Bible doesn't exempt any child from that. That's why you have to uh, be alert and be sober-minded about these things. The reaction instead, when we are being persecuted and suffering because of that, is it should be received with great joy. Why? Because we will share in His glory when He returns. The Bible is very clear. It's a test of faith. That's why I like the three friends of Daniel. Are you going to bow before this golden image? No. Well, we're going to put you in the fiery furnace. Well, if God delivers us, he can do it. If not, we're not going to follow you. It's a test for them. Can you imagine if, if all the difficulties that we're going through in life as far as serving the Lord is concerned, not when we're not serving God. If while serving God we go through difficulties, there should be an expectation of joy. Because the glory of the Lord is about to be revealed because His presence uh, rests in you and you are blessed. Now look at this. And then Paul, uh, Peter began to talk about wrong suffering. What is wrong suffering? You are suffering because of the following offenses. You are a murderer. You are a thief. You are an evildoer. You are a meddler. Murderer from our last lesson involves hating your brothers. When you still have trouble, don't, don't say it's Christian suffering. You're still up trouble. When you're a liar and you're being found out, it's not Christian suffering. Because thief, when you steal and you're discovered, that's not Christian suffering. Oh, you're an evildoer. But the, a meddler. Meddler here, another translation, you're a busybody. Ushusero. Okay, chismoso. When you, when you put yourself in trouble because of your goals. That's why, for, for example, I'm, I always train my kids this, and I'm doing my best to train my wife on this one. Say we're having conversation. Avoid making conclusions. Yeah. Without hearing facts. Because then you are treading on a very thin line of gossip. Yeah. Or the guy... Uh, fell on the floor. What you should say is the guy fell on the floor. Yeah. The guy needs help. What you should say is, but if you say the guy fell on the floor, lampa kasi. Who told you lampa yun? Lampa is a... Uh, huh? Clumsy. Is it clumsy? He's clumsy. What made you think he's clumsy? I always ask, what, what made you think he's clumsy? Like, like uh, my wife, my kids will tell me, Papa, don't be worried. Who told you I'm worried? Well, you raise your voice. Well, when somebody's excited, they raise their voice. Have you ever seen somebody excited? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> the Lord is good. I'm very happy. You don't do that. There's, there's an emotion involved. If you're excited, there can be the raising of decibel. You know, what is unusual is if there's excitement and you look like a dead wood. That is unusual. But when, you begin to, but when they tell me, don't be worried, who told you I'm worried? You see, you are making, that's, that's meddling. You are, you, are, you are saying, I am, I am worried when actually I'm not. I'm excited, but I'm not worried. That's why I don't like it when mama says, when my, my wife says, we have no money. Don't do that. 
we have money. <laughs> we, always, we never run out of money. may not be that much. But there is never a time when we don't have money. I have money right now. I have a few cents, I guess, in the car, you know. But that is still money. But when you begin to say you have no money, that's a, that's a lie already. Oh, somebody can't pay the debt. Oh, kasi hindi magaling mag-budget. Who told you that? What if there's really nothing to budget? You know? Just report, just proclaim what you say. Because, oh, suddenly you became a meddler. Meddler also is, instead of your business, you keep sticking your nose in it. Yeah. You know, some, sometimes my kids, my wife will hear of a problem. What should I do? I said, nothing. What, what do you mean by nothing? I know this. Yeah, nothing. Well, I know this. Yeah, you know that, but you don't have to do anything. People, people think they, they should meddle in everybody's business. No, mind your own business. Because you have to be very careful when, when, when you are, ang tanga-tanga kasi dapat ito ang binili niya. No, they have money. Let them buy it. Why, why did they, they buy this? I thought they have no money. Maybe they have money now. You know, let them, buy, let them enjoy it. Oh, they will suffer. Oh, you don't know that. You don't know that. But I think sometimes we meddle too much. We, we would like to make decisions for others when we ourselves can't make the right decisions. Now, proper reaction to Christian suffering. Let me just finish this. Okay? Let, let, if you are truly suffering as a Christian, let him not be ashamed or disgraced. Instead, glorify God. If you are being persecuted, if, if the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and uh, destroy you, and, and, and by the way, the devil will always use Christians. Remember in, in, uh, in the Bible, when God wants to bring trouble to Israel, the Bible says, and Satan steer up David to do a census on Israel. Look at this. Satan used David. If the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy you, he will use people. And if you are a Christian, most probably he will use other Christians yeah, to steal, kill, and destroy you. That's why, that's why you, need, you need to uh, be, not, not, don't be ashamed, know that you're suffering for Jesus, and glorify God, because you have the name, you are called a Christian. View this also as a beginning of judgment. The moment there is something going on in the household of God, if there is persecution, like right now there is persecution going on in America against Christians. Laws are forcing us to uh, give out contraceptives, some Catholic churches, uh, institution, to teach same-sex marriage. There's pressure. There's pressure about performing same-sex marriage in the church. It will never happen in this church. You know, when that happens, that means the world is about to suffer big judgment. Because look at this, the, the last statement. If the believers is saved from this, okay, the pressure that is coming to the church in China right now, the pressure that is coming to the church in Egypt right now, in Iraq, okay, in Nepal, in India, this tremendous, the pressure in America is nothing compared to the pressures there. When the believers survive this, which they will, you know what the Bible says? What will happen to the unbelievers? It will be their end. So, for example, if you are suffering right now, what will happen to the unbelievers? And by the way, in the next passages that we'll be reading, I think, or maybe I'm confusing my sermon for Saturday and Friday, but maybe we'll discuss it this, uh, this Sunday. Most of it will be, the Bible says, coming from those in the church. Yeah. When again, when 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 the, when the devil wants to hurt Israel, he steered up David to take a census in Israel. The most unlikely person to be used by the devil was used by the devil, and it brought. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe seventy thousand death in Israel as a result of what David did. But because the nation was already falling under judgment. When you begin to see the kind of persecution and suffering that the church is going through right now, you watch and you wait as to what will happen in the world. I will not be surprised if, if this will be the tragic end of some politicians used by the devil 
to enact some of these laws. Yeah. I will, I will not be surprised at all if some of these political leaders, political hacks, I will not be surprised if some of these journalists who are, who are spreading lies, I will not be surprised the moment judgment falls on them. But that is when the believers are saved. So when you are suffering, rejoice. Because that means your faith is being tested. Amen? Pray for your deliverance. Because when your deliverance comes, that is when the judgment will fall on the unbelievers. But that is in the scriptures. Okay? Learn something tonight? <laughs> we'll continue next week. Okay? We just ran out of time. I went over time by four minutes.